Hi, it's great to see you all. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. I'm Janice Kaminer Resnick, and on behalf of Jews United for Democracy and Justice and Community Advocates, Inc., I want to warmly welcome you into our Zoom room tonight. Today, I actually counted the number of virtual programs we have produced since last April, and I can say with certainty that tonight is our 73rd consecutive week of America at a Crossroads virtual town hall programs. Full unedited recordings of 71 of the programs can be found on our YouTube channel and on our website. There's an easy to use link in every email which David or I send to you. So you can always find it if you peruse through the emails we send There's an easy way to see any program you'd like. In tonight's program, we will grapple with the complex issue of Facebook and social media and the complexities of regulating that speech. We have two amazing guests. Shira Frankel and Eugene Volokh, and of course, the always great Larry Mantle, who in a moment will introduce our speakers. Our judge leadership team includes Mel Levine, David Lehrer, Zev Yaroslavsky, Caroline Kelly, and Rabbi Ken Chasen. You saw our list of co-sponsors on the screen a moment ago, and we are all grateful to all of our co-sponsors. We have some terrific programs coming up. Next week, we will welcome the brilliant and incisive New Yorker's Washington journalist, Susan Glasser. The following week, we will welcome Wall Street Journal's Michael Bender, who wrote the highly acclaimed New York Times bestseller, Frankly, We Did Win This Election, The Inside Story. And of all the nerve, the Jewish holidays are interrupting two of our September's, uh, two of our Wednesdays in September. But after Yom Kippur, we will welcome David Frum and then Jennifer Rubin. Jennifer Rubin's program will be focusing on how women saved our democracy from Donald Trump, which is the title of her new book. And we are very excited to announce that on October 6th, Senator Joe Manchin, who many believe is the most important and powerful member of Congress right now, will be joining the series as our guest speaker. His perspective is critical for us to understand, and we are grateful that he has agreed to join us. Be sure to sign up early. And I just want to remind you, because I spend a lot of time talking and emailing with various of you, of members of our audience each week, if you unsubscribe from our email list, you won't get the Zoom links, which you need to be able to attend our program. So if you inadvertently or intentionally unsubscribe, let me know and I can help you resubscribe. Also, if you are fully subscribed and are not receiving the link, that means that the emails are probably in your spam or junk files. So you might wanna check those out because uh, you'll find a whole bunch of emails from us. David Lehrer is uh, not able to be with us tonight, but he sends his warmest regards and he welcomes you on behalf of Community Advocates, Inc. And now to introduce our speakers and to begin this important discussion, please welcome a man who needs no introduction, at least to the Southern California members of our audience and likely to the rest of you as well as he is one of our most frequent moderators at America at a Crossroads, the great Larry Mantle. Larry has been the host of Air Talk with Larry Mantle on NPR member station KPCC 89.3 FM for more than 35 years. It is the longest running daily talk show in Southern California, and I listen every day, and he is great, and the show is great. Larry, thank you so much. Take it away. Janice, thank you so much. I, I appreciate your kind words. And it's always an honor to be a part of America at the Crossroads, the remarkable series of speakers every week, on some occasions twice a week, with special guests who are able to talk about the most important issues that we face in America today. I'm really looking forward to tonight's conversation, and I want to thank everyone at America at the Crossroads for making these possible uh, days. David, Zev, Mel, and all the others who serve uh, on the, um, the steering committee and others who have contributed to make these programs possible. Let me begin by introducing Shira Frankel, who covers technology and cybersecurity for the New York Times. She's based in San Francisco, and her recently published expose on Facebook is titled An Ugly Truth Inside Facebook's Battle for Domination. Shira's co-author is her New York Times colleague, Cecilia Kang. An Ugly Truth is the product of more than 400 interviews with individuals within the Facebook universe current and former employees, their families, friends, and uh, classmates. Also, investors in and advisors to Facebook are included. The book focuses on the run-up to the 2016 election through the post-2020 election crisis. 
Also joining us from right here in Southern California is Eugene Volok, the Gary T. Schwartz Professor at UCLA School of Law. He's a noted constitutional scholar, founded the popular libertarian-minded legal blog, The Volok Conspiracy. Shara, I'm going to spend the first several minutes with you to lay out the thesis of, of your and Cecilia's book that has gotten such tremendous uh, response. Um, let's talk first about, about the title. To what does it refer? The title of the book comes from a memo that was written by a Facebook executive named Andrew Bosworth. He's called Boz at the company. Uh, he's been there so long that almost everyone that's worked at Facebook has had some kind of encounter with Boz because he often introduces ideas that are, that are difficult for their own employees. In this case, he wrote a memo called The Ugly, which suggested that the cost of Facebook doing business of growing to be the largest social media platform in the world was that certain ugly things were going to happen. People were gonna get bullied, people could eventually you know, die or, or get hurt, but that was just the cost of doing business. And we thought that that memo was so stark and so important because it acknowledged a truth that underlied Facebook's business that its executives have not wanted to give voice to in the past. Well, and, and you argue that essentially these problems that Facebook has has had involving um, genocide in Myanmar, uh, disinformation about uh, vaccines, um, Russian efforts to influence the 2016 election, that all of these things are not really bugs, you argue, but are inherent in the business model of Facebook. Please elaborate. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing we really wanted to do with our book was lay out what Facebook's business model is and how it has these downwind consequences that Facebook itself wasn't aware of when it launched its business. So in this case, Facebook makes its money through ads, through advertisers. And in order to draw ads to the platform, it needs people's data. It needs to be able to go to those advertisers and say, we know more about the lives of these people than any other company. And we can help you target people with incredible specificity based on how much information they've told us about themselves. Now let's span out a little bit further than that. How does Facebook get that much data about you? Well, by getting you to spend as much time on the platform as they possibly can. They need you logged in several times a day really sort of engaging with content, commenting on content. That's how they know things about you. And they found over and over again, their algorithms have found over and over again, that what draws people back is emotive content. It has to inspire a reaction in you, whether it's anger or sadness or joy. But if you see something emotive, then you're more likely to engage. And over time, misinformation, hate speech, you know, things that are, you know, problematic in some ways on Facebook are the things that are also the most emotive. Well, and, and it sort of sounds like built in then inherently to the success of Facebook is this problem, because what sets Facebook apart from Twitter or from Instagram or the sheer number of people on Facebook. And so its popularity is part of, of the draw, it's sort of the opposite of the Yogi Berra. So many people go there because so many people go there. And if, if, if that is Zuckerberg's model and, and that is part of the attraction, then how do you decouple his sort of drive to get as many people on it as possible from the fact that that is the draw? I mean, you can't, <laughs> you unfortunately can't decouple those things. And what we wanted to do with the book was try and get into Mark's head as best we could to figure out what he knew about this platform when he started it. And I think something that was startling for me as a reporter was how little Mark Zuckerberg thought about these kind of downwind consequences. He has this approach to the world, which is quite, um, it's interesting. It's served him well at the company, which is that good speech will rise to the top and that people will seek out truthisms that people will want sort of truthful, positive information. And despite being shown again and again that that's not the, you know, the behavior of the average person, unfortunately, he has maintained this idea that he wants to allow all speech on the platform because bad speech will be weeded out and good speech will rise to the top. What about the argument that, you know, in the case of 
demonstrably false information or efforts to distribute misinformation, that there have been correctives to that. Let's take that uh, altered video of Nancy Pelosi, which showed uh, the House Speaker as though she was slurring her words and an intentional effort to make her look as though she was compromised. That was very quickly identified as having been a doctored video widely reported on news media that that was not an accurate um, reflection of, of how she presented herself. So in, in many of these cases, isn't, is it, it in a sense working because there are correctives so that people that do want to know the truth can find it and people who want to believe that that was really Nancy Pelosi under the influence um, you're not going to make them believe otherwise if they're emotionally invested in something that's untrue. I love that example because what it actually shows in that case, just again to remind people, there's a video of Nancy Pelosi and it's doctored, it's slowed down to make it seem as though she's inebriated. And a number of other platforms, including Twitter and YouTube, decide to take it down. Facebook leaves it up because Mark Zuckerberg argues that isn't this the type of thing SNL would do or you know any other sort of comedic television show? I think the problem in that argument is that SNL is labeled SNL, that people watching it understand that it's a parody. In this case, this particular video was circulated widely within Facebook, private Facebook groups, among people who did not think it was a parody. If you read the comments on those posts that day, and I was um, you know, reading thousands of them at that point, they very much believed it to be real. They believed her to be inebriated, to be compromised. These are not I mean, I, some of them even boast, you know, I only get my news from, um, and then they would name an, a very extreme sort of fringe right wing blog, and they say, I don't trust any other media. And this blog told me that Nancy uh, Pelosi is a well known drunk around Washington, DC. And of course, this video shows her as such. And so the conversation internally in these Facebook groups was reaffirming to one another. It's a closed system of people who are like minded because Facebook has driven them into the groups with like minded people. And they were inclined to believe this false video to be something it wasn't. And I would I would just add that something else Facebook's algorithms do is push people into these closed communities of other like minded people. So in this case, people who are have a tendency to believe in a prior conspiracy are pushed into groups on other conspiracies. If you join a group about the earth being flat, it is one click away from Facebook pushing you towards other conspiracies that you are then also likely to believe. And so those algorithms are just driving a certain kind of behavior, which isn't really replicated in the real world. And, and Shira, is that then back to the point you're making earlier that their attempt, what we do in radio is we try and build time spent listening. That's one of our markers of success is the longer people listen, the better. And that actually is factored into ratings. It sounds like you're saying that that drive inherent in Facebook to get people to be on the social media platform as long as possible, um, that is part of that is actually sending people into enclaves in Facebook, these small groups, where they're going to hang out. Exactly. And, you know, as journalists, we often look at that metric as well. I, I love it when I see that people have read to the bottom of my article. It's, it's rare, but occasionally we get to see that. And that's a sign that I've done something really wonderful. I've managed to keep them engaged for an entire article. Um, but, you know, I don't, I don't get algorithms to push people in a certain way. I get to just sort of use my writing skills to hopefully convince people to read the entirety of an article. In this case, they are pushing people towards these groups that they know will engage them for as much time of the day as possible. Uh, let me bring into the conversation, there's so much more in the book we'll get to with Shira, but let me bring uh, Eugene Volokh in. Um, Professor, uh, your thoughts generally about the business model of Facebook, you're, you're a free market person, libertarian minded, do you see a, a need here for Facebook to rein in the kinds of, of falsehoods, conspiracy theater uh, theories, and what uh, you know so many of us see as as dangerous commentary on Facebook? Well, let's just step back a bit. There's there's a problem. There's a huge problem that has been around for all of human history, but maybe more serious now, which is people say bad things. Could be false things. Could be evil things. Some people believe them. And of course, where you're coming from uh, influences what you think is bad. So people say, for example, advocate rioting, sometimes right-wing rioting, sometimes left-wing rioting. Sometimes people say very harsh things about various groups. They could be ethnic groups, religious groups, could be police officers. And some of the time that may lead to attacks on them. Uh, people say all sorts of false things about 
about elections, about, uh, uh, about uh, medicine, about it economics, I think a lot of pro-socialist advocacy is ridiculous uh, uh, and has been proven wrong time and again. I, it would be nice if somehow all of that vanished, many of us would think. But the question is, what do you do with that? How do you deal with it? There are three possible options. We've, throughout American history, we focused on two of them. The first option is have the government decide what is allowed and what is not allowed. Sometimes we do that, for example, with libel, provable falsehoods about people. Uh, that damage the reputations, they can go to court and get a libel judgment. Occasionally, there may be bans on other kinds of advocacy, although very rarely, and basically there aren't any viewpoints that the government can express. Uh, but basically, we've tried to rein that in because we think it's too dangerous. Not because all speech is wonderful, but because we think giving the government this power is too dangerous. Second option, leave it to the people, coupled with perhaps some institutions who speak out about various things, fact checkers and the like, uh, to, to make their decisions, recognize that it's going to be far from perfect, but conclude that it is the least bad of all of the alternatives. There's a third option, which I loosely call the I for one welcome our new robot overlords option, which is to say, you know, maybe the First Amendment is a little bit of a bug, and maybe we need to work around to it. Maybe what we need to do is we, maybe we need to have Facebook or and Twitter and various other entities step in and just get rid of stuff that people say that is evil, offensive, uh, um, uh, false, and the like. Uh, and maybe that'll make it better. And maybe, in fact, maybe you could say, look, we like the First Amendment because we don't want anyone sent to jail for speech or fined for speech. But if all they do is they'll lose their access to Facebook, well, that's OK. That's a possible argument. Part of the problem, though, is a lot of the same things that worry us about the government making decisions, I think, ought to worry us, maybe even more, about Mark Zuckerberg making these decisions, right? So, you know, we may think it's wonderful that Mark Zuckerberg has finally decided to block Holocaust denial. What about other historical claims? Uh, what about somebody who says, well, you know, some views that Israelis are saying about Palestinians are false? The historical account of the Israeli War of Independence is false, and we want you, Facebook, to ban uh, anybody who expresses those things. Or, of course, there have already been such requests by Armenians, uh, or I shouldn't say just Armenians, but people who, who argue that the Turks during World War I were engaged in a basically a religion-based and ethnic-based genocide of Armenians, the Muslim Ottomans, viewed the Christian Armenians as being kind of sympathizers of the Christian enemies, especially the Russians, and deliberately murdered many. That may, as best I can tell from my little knowledge of the field, that account is true, and Turkish denials of that are false. But I don't think I want Mark Zuckerberg to say, well, if you don't agree with the Orthodox account, we're going to boot you off of the system. So that's a question. And maybe our answer is, let's try giving Mark Zuckerberg this power, or let's have this oversight board do it. But that's the danger. Well, and and so you're referring to it as, as Zuckerberg, uh, the head of the company doing it. But what about having academics? So if it's historic claims, you'd right. have noted historians on the panel. If it's about COVID-19, you'd have people who are infectious disease specialists, public health authorities. They would be the ones who sure. would filter through the claims that are made about the pandemic. So right. what about not right. Facebook, but these panels doing that? Right. Maybe not a monarchy, maybe an oligarchy, right? Somebody, somebody would have to decide who's authorized. Because there have been some people who at least say that they're epidemiologists who have views that are somewhat different on various of these subjects related to COVID and such. Remember also famously, uh, Facebook and Twitter both blocked any statements that COVID leaked out of the Wuhan Chinese government infectious disease lab. It was blocked for over a year until there was some research done many by outsiders, much of it by outsiders, not even originally by journalists. Yeah. Uh, Shira, you wanted to comment on that. Go right ahead. Well, yeah. I, I would just tweak that slightly. So I think their ban was on the idea that China intentionally leaked the Wuhan virus. It wasn't limited to and that. then they, uh, sorry, just in the, in the case of yeah. Facebook, um, it was intentionality that they started banning and deleting because I, I wrote about it initially and I went back to them and I said, you know, since it's still under investigation, how could you ban it wholesale? My understanding from them and from at least the posts I saw on the platform, they were allowing people to talk about China as the origin as long as they didn't talk about intentionality that the Chinese government had done it with intention. So it was a shade of gray, at least with Facebook in terms of oh, what I, they were Oh, well, let's assume that. To say that usually when people think some government is doing bad things intentionally, 
usually we as Americans, and I'd say the same about other countries, but I want to speak for us as Americans because I know American law and culture better. We usually view viewed as having a right to, to, to speculate, to say, well, I don't think the government just accidentally did something. I think it was deliberate. I think there was a, either a plot or that's just part of American, of American uh, uh, government strategy. Some of it is conspiracy theories. Sometimes the government's been involved in some conspiracy. Well, I think, I think so you're onto something, though, very interesting, Eugene, because people speculate about stuff all the time. The fact is, we don't have any conclusive evidence at this point about the origins. There are theories that are stronger than others that experts have. There is not evidence at, at this point, certainly, that would point to intentionality on the part of the Chinese government. But by the same token, it, it is largely open. And Sheriff Frankel, you can make the argument that this kind of speculation, when we don't know, that it 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 may cause negative consequences, say, to Chinese Americans who Which are targeted is, yes. because of, of unsubstantiated claims, but that you you are weighing, you are making a trade-off there in closing down that speech to protect a group of people. Precisely. So in this case, just for a little bit more backstory, because I, I did some reporting on this at the time, the policy teams were largely acting in response to a rise in attacks against Asian Americans. They were seeing a huge spike. Their internal data was showing them a huge spike in hate speech against this group, especially Chinese Americans. And so this was a reactive policy because they wanted to stem some of that hate speech. Now, whether or not it was the right thing to do, I think is, is a fascinating argument. And I, and I think the broader point here of Facebook being the arbiter of truth, something Mark Zuckerberg has said he does not want to be, is extremely interesting. I, I guess I personally find this, this bizarre dichotomy here where on the one hand, Facebook doesn't want to be this arbiter of truth. Mark Zuckerberg says he doesn't want it. And yet he has, as we document in the book, that's part of what the book shows you, he has amassed power in a unique situation in which people who once advised him and made decisions alongside him five, six years ago and who were just other voices in the room helping to decide these things are no longer there. He is now more powerful and more in control of Facebook than he ever has been. And so you really do have a situation many times where a single person is making these enormously consequential decisions, not going to academics or subject matter experts for their advice and their guidance, but rather making these one-off decisions that have ramifications all over the world. And so in a, in a way, it's almost that worst case scenario of, of the, the, the scenarios you outlined of, um, you know, one person really deciding what will be allowed under our, our right. held rules of free speech. Shira, well, Shira what, can you just hold, uh, hold oh. a moment on that, Eugene? Uh, Shira, um, so what role does the Sandberg play in this? Because the, the thought was that she is the COO and being a very different personality than Zuckerberg and, and seeming to have you know, good intuitive people skills that the company desperately needed. And Zuckerberg, I think by his own admission has said are lacking. Um, how is she not able to temper that and to bring more people into the discussion? Great question. I don't think she knows that herself. We went into this book reporting, you know, thinking that we were going to find in the course of our reporting that Sandberg had been at the heart of some of these decisions, had influenced Zuckerberg on some of these decisions. And instead, we were told how often she was sidelined and ignored and how she would, especially, for instance, on the Pelosi video, she was, you know, in that situation, in that uh, office in which they were all sitting. She clearly said, we should take down the Pelosi video. It's the right thing to do. And she was ignored. And there are many other calls like that where she became the public face of decisions that she didn't believe in. And I and I think what it shows is, is you know, we have this chapter called the wartime leader because Mark Zuckerberg declared himself a wartime leader. Do you want to live with a wartime leader at the helm of this company, the world's largest social network for the rest of our lives? Shira, also, and I'll, I'll come back to you, Eugene, I promise. I did want to ask you about Myanmar because it's just such, it, it's such a painful, uh, horrible story. You have a whole chapter that's devoted to what happened there. So can you explain the inconsistency there of, of Facebook, how it responded to the government there versus how it responded to the genocide? Yeah, um, for, you know, for me personally, that was... Um probably the most important chapter to me because I reported in Myanmar in 2014 and 2015. I was one of the reporters that was in Yangon writing emails to Facebook saying, you have a serious hate speech problem in this country. And people on the ground are saying that it's going to lead to real world violence if you don't change something. And this is actually a perfect example of 
the problem not being whether or not it was hate speech, it was clearly hate speech. The problem was in Facebook's algorithms that were pushing it to the top of people's newsfeed. And so people who had never been online before were getting online for the first time. And the first thing they were seeing was post after post that told them that Muslims had committed horrible atrocities against uh, you know, B Buddhists in that country and that they were responsible for these beheadings and these rapes and these murders. And with no experience with the internet, they thought all of it was true. And you can you can read recordings, sorry, listen to recordings and read interviews from that time of people saying, if it's on Facebook, it's true. And what we show in this chapter is that this whole time you have activists on the ground who are sounding alarm after alarm and saying, this is, this is a fire, the kindling is going, it's a matter of time, please do something. And Facebook has one content moderator who speaks Burmese, a single person who's not even based in Myanmar, um, who is responsible for the entire country's content. And despite knowing what they know, they don't hire, I mean, sorry, eventually down the line, they hire two more people for a total of three people who are now responsible for monitoring the content of millions of people. And they were surprised, you know, they were surprised when it got out of hand and when they weren't able to keep track of all the hate speech spreading in that country. Uh, but they were very responsive, as you write, to, to the government when it lodged protests about Facebook. Right. And this is often the case. We see this in the Philippines. We see this in India and in Hungary and a number of other countries where when it comes to doing business in the country, Facebook will do everything it needs to do. You know, Facebook was in Myanmar, not by accident, because but they were there because they were very aggressive in entering that market as well as others. They were not nearly as aggressive in making sure that the population understood the technology that they were being given and were educated. I mean, when I when I talk about this book, people always ask me, what could they have done differently? And I always say, well, you know, media literacy. That is something that we might take for granted here in the United States, where we've had the internet for decades, but there are parts of the world where the internet is being first introduced and they are getting no media literacy. They don't know what tool they've just been handed. And you would think a company that's now been valued at a trillion dollars could afford media literacy programs. Eugene, back to you. I'm, I'm sorry, you were gonna make a point a couple minutes ago here. Well, what I wanted to, to float was what I think of as the reverse Spider-Man principle. You know, the line from Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. The reverse Spider-Man principle is, with great responsibility comes great power. So when you demand that people be held accountable for something or responsible for something, you're kind of requiring them to assume certain powers. Because otherwise, how can they discharge the responsibility? Let me give you an example of where we have no responsibility and no power, and I think it's good. Um, let's say we learn that the KKK, or if you prefer Antifa or the communists or whatever else, is using a telephone line for their recruiting. And it's not like because we eavesdrop on it, it's public, it's the phone number is on their leaflets. And let's say we call up the phone company and say we demand that you stop allowing such hate speech to be distributed on your phone system. I think if we try to assign responsibility that way to the phone company. The phone company says, sorry, we're not responsible. In fact, we're by law not responsible. We're so-called common carriers. We have no obligation because, and we have no power to block somebody's phone line because of their let ideology. Me, well, let me it's extend not, your it's analogy. Not, that, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, sure. I, Go I ahead. was just going to say why I don't think the analogy works. It would The equivalent would be if the KKK was given that phone line, but then they were given a special tool that let them call every single American at, you know, six o'clock in the evening, exactly when they're closest to their cell phones and make sure that the phone calls were received. I mean, the difference here yeah. is because it's not, again, so so sometimes people use this, this uh, equivalent sort of thing of, you know, everyone's in a room, don't they get to say what they want? And I say, no, it's because Facebook has given one person a megaphone. In no, this case, no. yeah, well, because Facebook's algorithms amplify certain speech. They oh. amplify one person's speech but over Facebook another. policies as to hate speech don't just say, we're not going to amplify in the sense of promoting it. That's a separate question. It's an interesting question. They say, well, we'll actually kick you off of the network if you express viewpoints that we think are bad. And uh, the reason I resist your analogy about calling everybody um, uh, at uh, six o'clock in the evening, which of course people do use phone lines to do, uh, is that in fact, with a Facebook page, generally speaking, it's not like you can send it out to total strangers uh, who have no interest uh, in, in, in getting this and you wake them in the, middle or in the middle of the night or you get them up in the middle of dinner. Generally speaking, certain uh, uh, for Facebook and for Twitter, by and large, 
the people who see it are people who want to see it, who subscribe to it, who've liked it. Or sometimes, it's true sometimes, people who Facebook has thinks have reason to, to uh, has reason to think that they're interested. But well, in I any mean, event, Facebook's you know, yeah, sorry. Well, Facebook's policies on hate speech are one thing, but as we've shown over and over again in our reporting, their enforcement is just not there. Um, you know, they don't, they just don't enforce. I mean, if you right. look at the top spreaders of information on Facebook, if you look at the top accounts that spread information on Facebook, I think you'll unfortunately find people that regularly, I mean, for, for years before it finally, you know, came about, they had people, you know, Alex Jones, you know, repeatedly spreading pretty horrific hate speech on their platform and he was the top sharer of information on Facebook. So, so it may be that they're not restricting it, but I wanna ask, do we want them to be in a position of restricting this? So I think we'd agree, maybe we wouldn't, but I think we'd agree we don't want the phone company to do that. We don't want UPS or FedEx or the post office to say, we refuse to deliver evil speech on our property. Maybe the post office is different because it's the government, but. UPS and FedEx, I take it, we wouldn't want them to say, you're an anarchist bookstore. We're just going to refuse to deliver material from you. They're not allowed. Again, they're common carriers. Um, and there are downsides to that, right? Because the phone system has been used by people to organize hate groups, to organize crimes, to organize, uh, um, uh, organize riots and the like. Eugene, so the let me, let's, is, let's... do we want Facebook to have the power that we deny the phone company? Maybe we do. But if we give them the responsibility, we're giving them a lot of power. Do we like them having this power? Well, and, and these, these are very important uh, legal and ethical issues. On the practical side of it, though, um, the point that Shira is making about the ability, the reach that Facebook has, that traditional conveyors of information have not had, um, creates a very different kind of public environment. So you can say theoretically that many of these principles hold, but as a practical matter, you have a rapid fire distribution of false information that doesn't get rebutted often until much later right. down the road. Right. You have people in life risking circumstances because of false information about COVID-19. So do we need to be thinking perhaps in a little different framework than, than how we looked at this historically because of the very practical ills, keeping in mind the trade-offs you're talking about, right. that, this, that this is not pure, it doesn't come without some significant trade-offs, but do right. we need to be talking right. about ways of trying to get there. Right, but part of the thing that's interesting about Shira's book, which I very much enjoyed reading, is very readable, very full of information, is it has two themes in it that, you know, maybe they're intention because life is full of tension. One theme is Mark Zuckerberg can't really be trusted. Maybe not because he's an evil man, but because he's a man, he's a human being. And, you know, human beings do things that are self-interested, do things that are, that uh, they say are public regarding, but are really self-interested, do things that they've actually talked themselves into thinking are public regarding, but are really self-interested, and make mistakes and have kind of personal foibles. So that's, that's all very important. And of course, Facebook, like all institutions, is full of human beings with human foibles. But then the second part seems to be, and we want them to have more control over public discourse. Now, of course, maybe not control the way Mark Zuckerberg wants to organize it, but it sounds to me that what you're saying, that they should be enforcing more rules against hate speech. It's too bad they're not enforcing more rules against it. So they should have this control. I'll give you another example. Twitter recently, uh, as I understand it from news accounts, but Twitter hasn't denied it, uh, and this is consistent with their policies, banned somebody, and I think at least a couple of people, for saying this. I think Laurel Hamilton is the name of this transgender weightlifter from New Zealand. Uh, who was born a man, now identifies as a woman, who's competing as a woman. And some people, I think lots of people, are pretty skeptical about that. Lots of people take the view that whatever one might think of transgender rights generally, when it comes to athletics, the reason we have a special category for female athletes is that the female body is in, operates in a particular so, way. So Eugene, I'm sorry so, to, to interrupt, you know, but I, we get where you're going. So did Twitter so, so uh, do we delete want the to have critique of her yes. competition? Okay. Well, what it said was you can't say this is wrong because Laurel Hamilton is a man. That's a viewpoint you're not allowed to express. Now, maybe lots of people think that, you sh that that is a bad viewpoint, but again, it's like, on the one hand, we don't trust these people, 
but on, because they've done bad things. On the other hand, we should trust them to make these decisions about what okay. can be Sh Shara, your, your response to that. I would say that the second point was not one that we um, that we made in the that you know we felt we argued in the book. What we were actually arguing was that Facebook should enforce the rules it has, pr you know, primarily that they will not recommend you join a conspiracy group. That you they will not promote hate speech and conspiracy to the top of your newsfeed so that it's the first thing you see. I actually think that you know personally, and I and um, I realize this is you know professors love to argue about the free speech. Uh, ramifications of platforms like Facebook. For me, what's far more interesting, it's it's more interesting to say, okay, let's let's shelve that for a moment because actually you could put together a body of academics and experts and people who are who, you know, have subject matter expertise to make these decisions about, you know, in a time of a pandemic, here is speech that's, you know, here are things that are dangerous. In a time of a pandemic, you shouldn't tell people to inject their veins with bleach because that will lead to death and, you know, da, da, da. I'm not, I'm not arguing by the way that that is what they should rule. I'm just saying, get together the experts who are, who know about this yeah. and give them power, you know, Separately, I think what we're saying for Facebook is that they have already said that they don't want to promote hate speech to the top of the newsfeed. They've said they don't want to promote misinformation. They say they don't want to recommend that people join groups that are full of conspiracies, and yet they continue to do so. And yeah. that that amplification is for us in our book, what we try to show again and again, that is the problem. It's not the speech that's the problem. It's Facebook having a machine behind it that amplifies things that are causing damage in society. Sure, Shira, is, is this a problem of the AI that they're using to identify it? Is that there aren't enough monitors? And I know there are thousands of them and, and haven't helped those people for the things they have to deal with. But um, is, is this just not enough resources or technological sophistication? So, and it goes back to your first question about the ugly and the ugly truth and the title of our book, which is that when you grow to become a platform, which in Facebook's case encompasses over 3.5 billion people against its family of apps, how many content moderators is enough? They are currently, you know, the, the only or the main social media platform in countries where hundreds of languages are spoken. I can promise you they do not have hundreds of content moderators in each of those languages. And so they've grown so fast into so many new markets, they can't possibly responsibly look at the content being produced. And that's why they've currently found themselves in a situation where they can't enforce their own rules and their algorithms, which again, focus on emotive content. So what's going to, what's going to inspire emotion. I know when I see a conspiracy theory on my Facebook feed, I'm, I might click on it just to say, I hate this. I don't want to see this. Why are you showing it to me? Facebook's algorithms still read that as engagement. And so when I log in next time, that's still what they're going to show me at the very first, the very first thing I see at the top of my newsfeed. Let's, let's take some questions from members of our audience. I just want to remind those of you, as Janice was saying at the outset, if you could please uh, include along with your first name where you're watching the program this evening, that would be great. Just to give a sense of place and the reach of, of America at the crossroads. Um, uh, let's see. Um, uh, do Zuckerberg's policies, Pamela asks, have simply economic underpinnings. Is this for him just all about revenue? Uh, less about revenue than power. He was influenced by some early libertarian thinkers, you know, famously Mark Andreessen, Peter Thiel. They, when Zuckerberg, you have to remember he was in his early 20s. He arrives to Silicon Valley. He is, as our book shows, not a very big reader. He doesn't really seem to be a person who's reading many books or ideas at the time about things like free speech or the free market, but he's given this idea, which is, well, let it regulate itself. And, and if you're in your early 20s and what you really want to be doing is coding a program, um, that's a really attractive idea to latch onto. And so Mark, who's driven really by this idea of power rather than revenue, it, he latches onto it. And it's something that we've seen him continue to be an adherent of until this day. Well, when you say power, what, what do you mean? Because we haven't heard he's interested in elective office or what, 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 what sort of influence are you speaking of when you say power? You know, he is a person who has always been obsessed with the Roman Empire. Um, Augustus Caesar is his favorite. And this idea of, of you know, elected office is too small. I mean, if again, he sits at the head of a company that influences the lives of 3.5 billion people. I don't think no leader in the history of the world can claim that percentage of the population being under their rule. He wants to be known in history books. He wants his to be to remember him as being a unique figure, which introduced a new technology that changed the world. And 
um, according to the many, many people we spoke to for this book, that is that is very much what drives him is what is, you know, what are the history books going to say when they write about him? So if I uh, just, if I yeah, go ahead, Eugene, interject, yes. Interject. Um, so imagine we had somebody who was running a phone company and who we knew idolized Augustus Caesar, wanted to be super powerful. We might be bothered by if the phone company acquires 90% of the market share, let's say. In fact, AT&T was at one point broken up as a result of that. We'd be bothered because we're afraid that maybe it's charging too much or maybe stifling innovation in certain ways. But I don't think we'd be worried, like what happens if he starts canceling the phone lines of his enemies, right? Uh, we, or even what happens if he starts prioritizing certain things. So certain kinds of services are available only to the, on the theory that they're amplifying are only available to ones he considers good guys. The power might be that he ends up being super influential in telecom, or maybe then he runs for office, or maybe then he uses his money uh, like George Soros. I don't mean that as pejorative, but he's certainly trying to, to influence the world through contributions. But we wouldn't think what happens if he just says this candidate can't be elected, we're going to cancel the phone lines of his get out the vote effort. With Facebook and Twitter, it looks like we're like if we do think that he's after power, we might worry like how is he going to deploy that power in influencing public debate? And that's what Since makes me skeptical of calls that he should use his power for good to influence public debate, because that is legitimizing a power that I'm not sure he should be having. Well, let me ask another question, uh, and this is along the line, since we're talking phone company, Silverman asks, uh, Professor Bollock, do you consider Facebook a common carrier? So the answer is, I don't believe it is a common carrier under current law, but I think that certain, certain examples that we have in the law, some of which are common carriers, some of which are places of public accommodation and the like, could be good models for how to regulate some functions, not all functions, but some functions. So I don't want to suggest, and some people have suggested the same, it's a common carrier, we're going to go to court and sue and demand that it'll let us out. No, no, that's not the current law. But if we're trying to think what the law ought to be, I mean, the decision to treat, to treat phone companies as common carriers was a decision that was made at one point by legislature, other decisions by Congress, other decisions were made by, by courts. Uh, but I think it's something that we should we should consider. Another sure. analogy might be, and I'm not I'm actually not wild about this model, but my own state of California, the Supreme Court said that uh, uh, shopping malls, because they've become the new town square, must allow leafleters and protesters. Interestingly, it arose in a case which involved uh, pro-Israel leafleters, uh, although the rule, of course, applies equally to everybody. A case called Prune Yard Shopping Center, you know. Maybe, so there is there maybe. is President Shira. What do you, what do you think about Silverman's question? Uh, should it be considered a common carrier? I think that's an interesting model. I I think that it's better than thinking of it as a communication company. I think there's been that argument, and I don't think it is you know a media company the way we traditionally think of it. Um, I think it's a new thing, right? I think part of the problems with the current monopoly laws and the antitrust laws is that they're trying to take laws that were created for oil and steel and the railroad and apply it to a company that's unlike any that has ever existed. And so I, I do think new definitions will be necessary for a company that is ultimately part utility, but also something else. Jonathan asks, would the antitrust laws being enforced uh, lead to the breakup of Facebook? And, and should that happen, Shira? I, you know, I think that remains to be seen. We know that this administration seems to be very serious in pursuing an antitrust case against Facebook. It will be an uphill battle again, because as I've said, you know, they are using laws that are not written for a modern company of the digital age. And so uh, I think they know that one of the first things they need to do is look at the laws they have on the books and, and figure out how to update them. Um, I'm going to quote my co-author Cecilia Kong because she's been based in Washington for 10 years and knows Washington better than I do, which is that she's never seen this much energy among Republicans and Democrats for some kind of antitrust action against Facebook. And so she seems to think that something is coming, but it will be much, much slower than uh, we think it will be. So it's another example of Facebook bringing people together, even in <laughs> DC, right? right? So, uh, Eugene? So I just want to say, I I'm not an antitrust expert. My brother actually is, but I, I'm not. Uh, and uh, it, it, I, I'm not sure that they violated antitrust law as it is. And certainly the notion of breaking up Facebook just as such into a bunch of them 
would be a strange idea because you want to be able to talk to all your friends and not one tenth of your friends, uh, uh, friends on Facebook. But that actually highlights one thing that some people have been talking about, which has to do with interoperability. Our phone system is set up so that I can, if I have a Verizon plan, I can talk to you even if you have a whatever is not owned by Verizon these days, a T-Mobile plan. Uh, and that's fine. And that's one reason why you have a lot of competitors, because otherwise, probably the biggest one would win uh, and would get almost the entire share. So maybe the solution is to say Facebook and Twitter have to provide things so that other platforms could allow people to get friends on Facebook and talk to them on Facebook. And then there'd be more choice in that, more kind of consumer flexibility. Some platforms can say, we are very censorious in a way that our users like. Others can say, no, no, we're all no holds barred or some mix of those. And then perhaps each one of them would be a powerful corporation, but not a mega powerful corporation that could easily sway the, the course of the elections. All over. I, I, I find it fascinating that there really hasn't been any social media platform able to compete with Facebook. And Shira, do, well, to, to what do you attribute that? I think Mark Zuckerberg is an incredibly ruthless businessman. And I think that a big part of the problem with the antitrust and really monopoly case is that it, so many of the mergers that he oversaw were not really examined critically at the time in which they were completed. And so for years, you saw Facebook buy or drive out of existence every single competitor. Um, the Onavo, which is an Israeli company that Mark Zuckerberg acquired, which gave him incredible insight and data into all of his competitors. I think that's something that regulators are going to be looking at, as well as their actions towards Snapchat. You know, they, they very clearly copied every one of Snapchat's features to try and draw users away and used a number of other tactics that I think, you know, are, regulators are going to be looking at that very closely and say, were these unfair business practices to drive out any possible competition? Uh, we have so many great questions tonight. I'm trying to get through as many of these as I can. Uh, Brian asked, do you see a difference between Facebook controlling content, in other words, speech, versus controlling amplification in distribution? Shira? Absolutely. And that's the distinction we've really been trying to drive home, is that we can get very lost in the conversation about speech because it's an incredibly nuanced conversation that requires specificity about situations. So, you know, are we talking about speech during the time of an election, about people trying to disenfranchise the vote? Are we talking about speech during a time of a pandemic where people's lives can be endangered? Are we talking about speech in a country which is currently under war? You know, are we talk about speech in a place like Iraq, where it's very different than here. So that conversation is, is one that I would encourage people to, to be engaged with, but also to shelve for a moment and focus on this other part of the, the equation, which is the algorithms and the amplifications. And that is something that despite promising again and again that they're going to do better on and they're going to stop Facebook. I mean, there's just a report that was published last week, which showed that Facebook is still promoting anti-vaccine groups. They're still promoting anti-vaccine content. I got that report and I'm a mother. I went onto Facebook. I immediately typed in, you know, common cures for the, for the cold for a toddler because I wanted to see what group it would recommend. Sent me to a group, which was natural remedies. The minute I joined it, the next group it asked me to join was an anti-vaccine group. So its algorithms are still pushing people there that they think will be inclined towards believing conspiracy theories. That That is, though, sort of a crossover, right? Because the, the uh, and I just throw, the, throw this out, there's sort of, you know, theoretically, we can say it's okay for people to actually make anti-vaccine arguments. The issue where it crosses over, right, is to make fallacious arguments uh, uh, outrageous claims about the vaccine to try and frighten people away from getting vaccinated. It, it, I mean, is that not an important distinction no, it, as well, opposed it, to Facebook well, just promoting vaccination? It, it is, but again, it? again, that becomes a free speech question and where do you cross the line? I think again, for, for me personally, why recommend the group? Why encourage people to join a group who's in time? I mean, the motto, the, 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 the statement of purpose of this group was that vaccines kill children, measles vaccines kill children. You know, that was what this group was created to promote. And Facebook was telling me to join it. So okay. that's the that's the problem there. I see. Eugene? So, so Larry, so it's funny you said fallacious arguments, because a lot of times it starts out, well, what about proven outright falsehoods? Like vaccines kill this many children this way. Let's say we've got, we can figure it out as best medical science can, which is not perfect. Let's say we can figure this out. But then 
quickly it moves to what about fallacious arguments? Larry, you've, you've done a lot of radio. I'm sure you've heard a lot of fallacious arguments. Yes. You've heard a lot of where both sides quite sincerely accuse the other side of fallacious arguments. I mean, if we were to say Facebook should now block fallacious arguments, things that aren't logical, things that overstate things, that exaggerate things, again, consider the power there. Likewise, imagine somebody, imagine somebody is saying, by the way, I don't agree with this. I think vaccines are, are a great idea. I, I want, I want to, I'm waiting for my third shot eagerly. Uh, but let's say somebody has an argument saying, you know, vaccines, how can we be sure they're safe? Nobody can really be sure they're safe. We have seen real bad, bad side effects. Maybe there's some advantages to being unvaccinated. Maybe that could give you more immunity than, um, than vaccine would. All of that, that may be bad for society to spread that, but it's not somehow objectively false facts. This is speculation, it's opinion, but, it's conjecture. It's the sort of thing that we usually would protect. I appreciate Shira's point that we might say, leave it up, but Facebook shouldn't take the affirmative step of itself further promoting it. And that I think could be a very important legal distinction. Keep in mind though, though still, if it's as big a corporation as it is, if it has as many users as it does and as much of a monopoly like Perch, even the power to decide what to recommend would give Zuckerberg or Zuckerberg and Sandberg, if you prefer, that he listen more to her or some panel of people. Yeah. Okay. Tremendous power. Uh, uh, let me ask another question here. Uh, Robert asks, how much does the legal immunity that social media has contribute to Facebook's issues? Shira? Um, you know, the Section 230 laws that have been on the books for years have certainly given them some immunity, and I think they have enjoyed that. But they're also, I think they themselves are struggling with this, and you hear Facebook executives calling for regulation themselves. And I think that part of that is that they know that whatever regulation is going to be handed down will be something that they will likely be able to meet. For them, it's much more difficult to be currently in a situation where they're being asked to make these calls and decisions. They would love it if members of Congress gave them a list and said, here are the hundred things that we are not allowing you to put on the platform. They would create a checklist and they would mark it all off and their job would be done and they'd call it a day. And then any complaints or problems would go to Congress, not to them. Um, I don't think that's likely to happen. Um, and so, yes, I mean, I think they're still left in this position of Section 230 having not been updated for a very long time and um, not really addressing the situation that we currently find ourselves in with social media. Sharon asks, how do European regulators uh, deal with Facebook? Shira? European regulators, you know, it's interesting. In Europe, um, privacy laws are certainly much more advanced than they are here in the United States. They've dealt with a lot more questions of data privacy. I actually think Germany is a really fascinating example because Germany's laws on hate speech are very different than those of the United States. Largely because of what happened during World War II, face, um, Germany has incredibly strict laws about what you can say, which include not being able to, the legal, you know, legally in Germany, you cannot, you cannot spout anti-Semitic ideas. And so what happened in Facebook's case is that Germany said, look, these are our laws. You have to take down any anti-Semitic content. We have a zero tolerance policy. So we're going to give you, I think it's 12 hours, roughly 10, 12 hours, by which you have to remove anything anti-Semitic proactively. We don't want to have to report it to you, which is Facebook's system in the rest of the world. We want you to proactively go and remove it yourself. And so Facebook was forced to hire tens of thousands of content moderators in Germany who speak the German language so that they could meet that country's laws. And I'm, again, I'm, I, without arguing whether or not they should be taking down specific pieces of anti-Semitic content, what's interesting here is that Facebook had to hire all these people. They had to contend with the problem and adequately moderate the content in a really responsive way as opposed to here in the United States, where often if you complain about something being anti-Semitic, it could take a week or longer just to get a response from someone at Facebook answering your query about whether or not they will take it down. Andrea asks, what can I do to combat the downside of, of Facebook's work? Um, Eugene, what, what do you think? Well, what's your job? Are, are, you, are you in Congress? If so, great. If uh, you, you can vote for various things, although I'm not sure which ones you should be voting for. Part of the problem is it's very hard to do anything about this, partly because Facebook is so powerful, but partly because Facebook provides services that lots of people really like. And many of the things that we are com complaining about are things that people really like, right? If when we say it's so bad that Facebook provides the system through which people are encouraged to spend more time by giving them these incendiary things, what we're really saying 
is Facebook is doing a great job of giving people exactly what they want. Note one analogy, which was quoted in the book. It's like, it's like somebody seeing all oh, my customers want junk food, I'm gonna give them more junk food. Well, we can fault that as a public health matter, but obviously it's the business doing what we expect a business to do, which is to listen to its customers about what they're interested in, both in what they say and what they actually do, because actions sometimes speak louder than words, and give them what they want. So I think, I, I think the argument here, though, is, Eugene, that that in the case of Facebook, it's not just people making poor choices about what they eat, that it it foundationally undermines democracy. No, that's no. The, that's right. the argument. Larry, I totally appreciate that. And you could say that this is something that we ought to somehow regulate. But the question is what to do about it. One problem is there will be some pushback, direct or indirect, from the fact that lots of people, like imagine you have a proposal saying, no, Facebook should not promote things that people find emotionally engaging. The consequence is many Facebook users would be unhappy with it because that's actually what they like. Yeah, they, they stop using like. it. Share the same question for you, please. Then we need to wrap up. Sure. Well, Eugene made this really easy for me, which is that great. Think of it like junk food, which is that, you know, it's sugar. We all know that a lot of sugar isn't good for us. And it's unfortunately, it tastes really good. So we're not going to give it up in our lives entirely. You accept a certain amount of sugar in your life because you like the way it tastes. It's become a part of your life. And then once in a while, you like to eat a piece of cake, but you don't eat it all day long because you know it's going to rot your brain. And so thinking about Facebook in much the same way of a lot of Facebook, a lot of that sugar is not going to be good for you is a great way to approach, you know, how you moderate your own Facebook use and how you approach what you share on the platform. Right. I want to give you each a chance for a, a quick wrap up, Eugene, like 30 seconds or something. Just leave us thinking about this issue as we uh, adjourn tonight. Sure. I just want to return to what we've been talking about. I think both of us agree. It's a question of power and who has the power to decide what can be said and also relatedly what is going to be heard by a lot of people. Uh, and we could say it's the courts or juries or the legislature or the president. Uh, or we could say it's Facebook and Twitter and the people who run them or the people whom they hire to help them. That's, or we could say nobody and it should be up to, to ordinary citizens. Those are the big issues. All right. All right. Uh, Eugene, thank you so much, Professor Eugene Volokh of UCLA. And I neglected to say when I introduced Shira that she and her investigative team two years ago won the Gerald Loeb Awards, the George Polk Awards, extremely major awards for investigative journalism, and that she and her teammates, including her co-author, were finalists for the Pulitzer Prize. And important for me to share that with our viewers tonight. Shira, final thoughts. I would say that all is not lost and it is not hopeless because we do know that there are things that work and that we can do outside of what we want these companies to do for us. And one of those things that I think people could encourage their own school districts to do and their members of Congress is to launch media literacy programs. I think a lot about the next generation that's coming up online and what they're going to contend with in terms of deep fakes, AI powered videos, seeing and hearing things that are not real and being asked to decide what what is real online and what is not and it's not too late there are countries like estonia and singapore that have rolled out these programs if we here in the united states made the decision to do the same a number of countries would follow and it would put us in a much better position for the next generation that's going to be joining the internet Shira Frankel, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And I'm, I'm actually going to hold up the book so you, you don't have to do that. But <laughs> uh, the thank book you. is An Ugly Truth, uh, Inside Facebook's Battle for Domination. Shira Frankel and Cecilia Kang of the New York Times, the co-authors of the book. Before I tell you about next week's great program, I want to take a moment just uh, to say personally how much it's meant for me to be a part of these great conversations. I come away after these hours, having learned so much and thinking about things in, in such a fuller way than I have going into them. And I just want to encourage you, as these have been such a, a smash success, thousands of people every week joining us in these conversations, uh, 69 consecutive weeks, uh, to be clear, to please visit the websites of Community Advocates, Inc., 
and Jews United for Justice and Democracy. These two organizations share the responsibility, share the funding of putting these programs on. And I would urge you to visit their websites, see what they're involved with. This arguably is their major program right now because it's a tremendous amount of work that all of the people doing this, uh, Janice and David, all the others put into it. But please consider making a contribution to support these important programs that I think are unlike anything else that are available uh, across the country and around the world today. Now, as for next week, five o'clock next Wednesday, uh, Pacific time, eight o'clock Eastern, the New Yorker's White House correspondent, Susan Glasser will return to America at the crossroads. She'll be interviewed by the LA Times, my good friend for many, many years, Pat Morrison. Uh, and we wanna thank you and invite you to join Pat and Susan for their conversation next Wednesday, August 25th, five o'clock Pacific, eight o'clock Eastern time. Thank you again for joining us and have a very good evening.